Good morning. Good morning. You guys will never know how good it is for me to be back. Uh, last week we attended church in Houston. Very well done. Very well. Everything was in its place. And, uh, it wasn't home. And it wasn't you guys. Uh, and I was very reminded how blessed I am to be able to, to fellowship here with you guys. Uh, it, it was, uh, last week was a, a very good week. Travels went well. Um, dry weather all the way down, a little bit of snow on the way back in Pueblo. So the travels went great. Everybody that went down got down safely. Everybody that came home came home safely. So that was what went well. Uh, the service for Dad went well. Um, It was, a, it was a good time. Um, I, I did sing. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody caught any video of it, so you got a lot. Oh. No, I, don't know, I don't know if there's any video of it or not. <laughs> uh, I hope not. <laughs> um, but it was a good time, you know, um, to get the family together, to uh, be able to celebrate a life that... Uh, You know, I had a number of people seemingly puzzled by my not just having like a meltdown or a breakdown or whatever, and, and uh, I was talking with Christy about it. Yeah, yeah. I don't like to cry, ever. Um, I did cry. As a matter of fact, while that service was going on, I didn't even know I was crying. I reached over to grab something and my shirt was wet, and I thought, what the heck? <laughs> and, and then I realized, oh, I'm crying. Well, that's embarrassing. Uh, but I, I am firmly fixed of mind where my father is. And after having seen what he went through, I wouldn't want him back. And to be honest with you, he's in a better place than any of us are right now. And we have to be firmly believing in that. That when we die, we actually just graduate. We move on to something better. That's what I can say with such certainty. It's better for me to die and be with him. But for your sake, I should stick around for a while. You know, we, we really need to have fixed in our minds and our hearts that what God has planned for us is so much better than what we have to do. And so, um, beautiful service. Um, people got up and, and shared a lot about my dad. They shared a lot about the change in my dad. Uh, there were pictures on, the, I don't know how many tables, 20 tables maybe. And there were well over 100 pictures on each table. And it was really cool because a lot of the people there that knew him only knew him as, you know, the post-Jesus, after salvation, Gary. But there were a few that knew him before. And... Uh, you could look at the photos of my dad and you could see the physical change in him. You could see the before pictures, there was a hollowness to his eyes. There was a, something missing. And after, there was life expressed out in the face of my dad. There was a countenance change. And so, we got to have an opportunity. It was open to whoever wanted to get up and talk. Um, Christopher got up and he actually read a poem that he wrote for my dad. And uh, we did have a, a pastor get up and give a salvation message. My dad, my dad had left checkout instructions. <laughs> and that's what they're called, checkout instructions. <laughs> I'm out of here, this is what needs to happen. <laughs> and uh, I had one for him and one for mom. And, uh, you know, he said, I don't want a funeral. I don't want a memorial service. I want a celebration. He said, uh, you know, we had over, a, a, what, 150 balloons were released. Uh, he had military honors. Um, you know, our family saying, uh, I had a niece that got up and signed, I can only imagine. Uh, we had a couple of, of slideshow presentations, pictures of my dad's life. Um, you know, and people got to talk about it. And the one thing that kept coming up that was a recurrent theme is, wow, what a change. My dad was mean before Jesus. He had, he had anger issues. And, and 
you know, we, we kind of joke, when Christian and I got married, I had two emotions, angry and not quite so angry. My dad just had angry. And he came to the Lord. And like I said, I have never, there are probably three, possibly four people that I can look at in my life that I can definitively point to and say, yes, God is in that person's life because I can see the change from before and after. But my dad was the first one I ever saw. And uh, not that he didn't mess up. Oh, my dad <coughs> messed up a lot. He still struggled with the things that he'd grown up learning and, and conditioning himself to. And he still had moments where he'd get angry. And um, But there was just the, the theme that ran through this whole thing is what a change Christ had made in my dad. It was, a, it was really a very cool opportunity. A um, little bit tough. We had to go through his things and sort out what went where. And, and um, I was a little concerned because, you know, before my dad even died, there were a couple of people in our extended family that were like, oh, I want that. Oh, I want that. I'm like, he's not even dead yet. But that's a piece of junk. You're worried about that. That didn't happen at all. As a matter of fact, um, when... The five kids and my mom got together. It was very gracious. Um, hey, if you want it, take it. It's yours. Uh, quite honestly, they gave me stuff that I didn't want. Uh, they gave me a pen and pencil set because I'm a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but we got photographs, and that's what I told them. I said, I want copies of all the photographs. So, um, very good service, but like I said, it is, oh God, it's good to be home. Thank you, God, for bringing us back home. And I determined after being down there for a week, I love my family, I miss my family, but God has placed us here, and this is my family, okay? So it's, it was, uh, you know, coming down into the valley, everybody starts to me, we got into Montana, and everybody was excited. Who wouldn't be excited after Wyoming? <laughs> we were all excited, and, and then driving from Billings and coming through, and oh, there's snow in the mountains, oh look, Bozeman, Butte, who gets excited about Butte? I got excited about Butte because it was closer to home. <laughs> and, and then, you know, coming into the valley, and, and uh, you know, it's just, you thank God, Christian, I thank him almost daily that he has placed us here, not only in this body, but in this valley, in this community. Um, and and I, I'm going to be sharing today, because this goes on um, I have a confession. I am, uh, my proclivity is to be a complainer. Um, I, I like to chalk it up to being a perfectionist, but mostly because it's easier to complain. Um, nothing is ever quite right. And, and you know, I, Christian, I can stand up by a front window and she'll go, oh, aren't the mountains beautiful? And I'll go, oh, it's overcast. <laughs> and she'll say, yes, but now we have shade from the sun. And I'll say, yeah, but now I got a water. Or now I, you know, and, and I have a tendency toward the negative. Okay. Um, you know, the, oh, an optimist sees the glass is half full and a pessimist sees it as half empty. I see it, I didn't want that. <laughs> I didn't want something else. And, and God has really been dealing with me over the last probably two years. He's been trying to bring about in me a change. Now, I know God is making the change, but he's making me aware of the necessity for the change. To be a man of thanks. And we're in Colossians chapter 3 today. And I had kind of pointed the idea, wouldn't it be neat if it came out this way? I didn't plan it. I, I don't really plan out my messages like that. But um, Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 12. We're going to read through 15. And we've been talking about what it's like to be plugged into the vine that is Jesus Christ. And what that fruit should bear in our lives. What we should look like. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're not like the fruit of the loom guys that walk around in grape and apple seeds. We should have fruit exhibited in our lives. And so in verse 12 it says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. And so today we're going to deal with and be thankful. And we're going to do this a little bit different than my normal messages. I'm, I'm going to share a couple of things that I have. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> But then, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to give you guys opportunity. Now, in your bulletins, you guys should have a piece of paper that looks like this. Okay. First, I'm going to give you a few minutes. You're going to write down what you're thankful for. Now, I filled in the first two for you. Okay? Because I know some of you guys. You'd be like, okay, Number one, God. Number two, Jesus. Number three, the Holy Spirit. Number four, Mom. Number five, Dad. Number six, my wife. Number seven. And you just go on down like that. So I've been taking care of all of that in the first two. Okay? So I'm going to give you a few minutes. And we're going to... You've got space on there. Why don't you just fill out the things that you're thankful for? Okay? So um, I would do the Jeopardy theme song, but we're not going to. I'm just going to let you guys take a few minutes. If you need a pen, there should be one in front of you. Does anybody need a copy of this? Does anyone else need? another minute or so.
Okay. You guys can keep a hold of those because that's something that I would like for you to take a look at on Thursday. Uh, feel free to add to it. Hopefully you won't take anything away from. How many did Ava get? Let's see her right over there. Wow. <laughs> Well, in looking through God's Word, I've come across a couple of troubling things. And one of these has, has bothered me for a long time. Back in Ephesians chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read you this passage. Um, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this has bothered me for a long time because how do you thank him for things that stink? Um, I, I admit I struggle with thanking him for diabetes. I don't like to thank him for having to stick myself and check my sugars and do all that garbage. I, I have a problem with that. And I was reading, uh, when I was younger, I was reading uh, the story of Corey Ten Boom and how she and her sister Bessie were in the concentration camp and, and Corey was complaining and you know their, their barracks was just beriddled with fleas and lice and Corey was complaining about the situation and circumstance they, they were in and Bessie looked, told her, she said, well, you need to keep in mind that God says we're to be thankful for everything and she said, well how can I be thankful for fleas? And she said, Corey, you're looking at it wrong. She said, because of those fleas, the guards don't come into our barracks and we're free to worship God as we will. We're free to pray for each other. We're free to minister. We can do as we will that we wouldn't be able to do if it weren't for fleas. And I was struck by that because really it's a matter of perspective. I don't know what the significance of me being a diabetic is. Don't know. I know for a long time I was in a church that, oh, you need to be healed of that. You know, and, uh, you know, healing's in the atonement. And if you're a Christian, you shouldn't have diabetes. Or if you're a Christian, you shouldn't need glasses. You shouldn't have wrinkles. So, <laughs> so I, I went through a struggle for a long time with being a diabetic and how does that work with Christianity. And ultimately, here's what I came up with. Okay, this is my simple thing. God does as God wills. And I will praise Him to you. Because that's what it's given to me to do. To praise Him. To thank Him. Because no matter my situation, no matter my circumstance, it's not based on where I'm at as to how worthy He is. So, looking through Scripture, I've broken down into a number of categories things that we are typically thankful for. The first thing, kind of looking over your list, I wonder how many of you have each of these things. The first thing is stuff. Now, not that stuff is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, David got a lot of stuff. Solomon got even more stuff. That was God's blessing unto them. As a matter of fact, when they came into the promised land, God divided them up and he said, look, these, this is what will happen if you follow my decrees. And this is what will happen if you don't. And if you did, there was stuff that came with it. The, the, the ground would produce much crops, much bounty. There would be a lot of stuff that came with it. And if you didn't, it wouldn't. There would be drought. There would be famine. Matter of fact, he said, look, I want you to give the land its Sabbath rest. And, and don't worry about it, because in the sixth year... I'm going to give you enough not only for the sixth year, not even enough just for the sixth and seventh, but I'm going to give you enough for until the first year again until you can reap a new harvest. That's his promise. Okay? But we get too caught up in stuff sometimes. We're Americans, right? We're based on stuff. It's, it, it's a signal of your prosperity, how well you're doing in life. Uh, when, when's the last time you bought a new car? How big is your flat screen TV? How big is your house? And how many decorations do you put out at Christmas? We have a fixation with stuff. And it 
never seems to satisfy. We just have this insatiable desire for more. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that there's a spirit of covetousness in America. There's a spirit that dwells on people sometimes where, um, you know, I, I remember being a kid and I, I, I used to read the comics every Sunday and my dad hated it. My dad required that I start at the front of the newspaper <laughs> and read to the comics. Why? They're on the back. All I gotta do is flip it over. I don't have to look for them. I know where they are. You gotta start at the front and read. Oh gosh, there's a lot of junk in there I never liked. And so I was reading The Born Loser. You guys ever, does anybody here know that? That uh, comic strip, okay, The Born Loser. And uh, the guy's wife comes in and she's wearing a mink coat. And he's like, where did you get that mink coat? She said, oh, it was on sale. I saved $500 <laughs> by buying this mink coat today. He said, good, go buy four more and we can pay the mortgage. <laughs> but don't we have kind of that attitude where we have, you know, oh, if it's on sale, then I must get it. If I say 40% off of this, no, you spent 60% on it. You know? Well, I was going to get it anyway. If you're going to get it anyway, great, get it at a discount. I'm not, I'm not a shopper. Kayla? Is Kayla in <laughs> Kayla warned Carrie. Because Carrie, the one thing Carrie wanted to do when she went to Houston was go shopping. And Kayla told her, in front of my face, do not go shopping with Dad. <laughs> what does that mean? She said, there's just pressure. <laughs> How did I pressure you? She said, it's, there's just this vibe that I get. I, I can't look at things. You just, I can't do it with you around. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry I exude the no shopping vibe. I'm a purchaser. Okay? I, I, I'm, I'm simple. I'm direct. Trevor and I used to make fun of each other because Trevor would circle the parking lot seven times to get that parking spot closest to the door. I go to the first open parking spot, walk in, walk out, wave at Trevor as he's still parking. <laughs> okay, I'm a purchaser. I don't like to shop. But material stuff. Now, stuff isn't necessarily a bad thing. As a matter of fact, um, The Prayer of Jabez. Everybody familiar with that the little booklet? Remember the little booklet that came out? Really, really cool idea, really cool concept. It's not necessarily bad to ask for things. But what I want to ask you today is do you spend more time asking for new things than you do thanking him for the things that he's given you? Because I look at the stuff that I have and I've got a bunch of junk that was so important for me to get at the time. And now the time has passed on, I go, uh, I don't even remember what I bought that for. Um, cultivating an attitude of thankfulness. Take time and thank God for what he's given you. And be aware that some of that may have been the devil. Some of that stuff that you got, you may have just succumbed to temptation and invited sin into your house. Okay? Cultivating an attitude of thankfulness. Be willing to get rid of or not buy what you don't need, what God doesn't want you to have. Remember the Lord's Prayer? When Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, he said, give us today everything we want and a little more. <laughs> oh, no, give us today just the newest bottle of car. <laughs> no, he said, give us this day what we need for the day. Give us today our daily bread. He didn't say... Give us this week's groceries. <clears throat> or, uh, give us today our daily bread. Be content in the moment. Now, I'm telling you this because this is what I'm learning. I know you guys are further along than I am. So bear with me. And when, when I say something you already know, just say, you'll get there. Dear. Okay? Okay? Because I'm learning this. I'm, I'm really struggling with this. On the way home, um, I don't really fit with my biological family too well. God is kind of, I've always been kind of outside. I mean, yeah, we get together and you guys think, oh, you're alike as peas in a pod. <laughs> but I, I don't really fit with them too well. And I was really struggling on the way home. And uh, part of it is distance. You know, it's hard to be as close and intimate when you're 1,500 miles apart. That's, that's tough. Um, 
But part of it is we just have a different mentality, a different idea, different priorities. And um, being somewhat melancholy by nature, I was contemplating and starting to get depressed. And, and I was reminded about what God had wanted me to speak this weekend. And, and he said, I want you to start thanking me for things. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going through my checklist of all the things that I don't like. And he said, well, let's start looking at those and start changing your perspective on them. I have a family. I have a family. I know a lot of people that grew up without. I have a family. I have a family that loves me. Okay. Um, you know, I, I have, I've, I've talked about my brother that's 15 months older than I am and now, you know, when I was 12, we got knives for Christmas and at New Year's they were taken away for trying to stab each other with them. I got that knife back at my wedding. <laughs> I did. Mom saved it for my wedding. Give it back to me. Um, but I know that he loves me. If I ever needed anything and it was in their power to do it, my family would, would take care of it. Okay. Let's be thankful for those things. I know that my family knows the Lord. I can talk with any one of my siblings, any one of their spouses, and we can, we can fellowship as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, not just because of a freak of nature, not because of biology, but because we have made a choice. And as I started listing off these things, all of a sudden I started, to, the load started to lighten. And, and you don't even realize how much being negative weighs down on you until you can start letting some of that go. Being thankful for things. Um, so, material stuff. What, is, how, what does Paul feel about material stuff? Did Paul have a problem with it? Yeah. He had a problem with our fixation with it. In Philippians, flip over to Philippians with me if you would. Chapter 4. You guys should have that chapter pretty well marked. I refer to it often, but we're going to go to a little bit different place. I'm going to start in verse 10. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. Paul writing to the Philippians says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, oftentimes we hear this. And it's all, oftentimes with a negative connotation as to having much is a bad thing. And having little is a good thing. No, what, he, what Paul is saying here is I've learned the secret to be content regardless. Regardless. <coughs> Whether I have much, I am content. Have you ever noticed that the more you have, the more you want? Isn't that bizarre? I mean, you, you would think that if somebody won the lottery, they'd be set for life, right? You realize that, what is the number? It's like 78% of people that win the lottery are bankrupt within five years. Five years. A million dollars. Gone. They're bankrupt. Well, now that I've got it, what do I, oh, I want this, oh, I want that, oh, I want the other. But he said, I've learned the secret to be content. Whether I have much. Look, he's not talking about, oh, if you have much, you're in sin. He said, be content with what you have. If you have little, be content with what you have. Well, Paul, how do I, how do I be content? Well, I can do all things through him who strengthens me because it's not based on what you have or what you don't have. It's based on who you have. Right? I mean, if, the, if we really have God who dwells in us, who goes before us, who is by our side, what do we have to want? So, is things, is stuff a bad thing? You know, it's what is in here. James addresses that when he's writing his epistle. He says, you know, you have not because you ask not or because you ask amiss. And then he goes on to say that you may spend it on your own pleasure. Now, again, we come right back to America. And I say America because I'm American and we're living in America. It would probably be the same in Spain or, or uh, you know, Timbuktu or wherever because people are the same everywhere. 
okay? If I have one sheep, I'd really like to have two so that they could breed and I could have more, okay? We, we have that mentality as people. But all too often when we ask God for things, why are we asking? Why are we asking? Are we asking that it might glorify Him? Or are we asking that it might glorify me? Are we asking for our own desire for stuff? Okay, really, do you need that? I mean, think about this for a minute. I dare say, everyone in here, or most of the people in here would say, I need a vehicle. But I disagree. You may need transportation, but you don't necessarily need a vehicle. Much less two. Because there for a long time I was convinced we had to have two vehicles. How long has it been since we had two vehicles? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. We're doing just fine. Okay. We, we managed to go get everything done that needs to be done. Sometimes it has to take place tomorrow. But everything gets done. Okay. God has a way of reshaping my I need. Oh, I need this. Oh, I need that. I have no clue. I have no idea, really, what I need. Now, don't get me wrong, because sometimes God blesses us with stuff that we don't need just because He likes to bless His kids. There was a time in mine and Christy's life where we were... Uh, I, I couldn't get a job. I mean, I'm out pulling weeds in people's gardens to earn money. Um, I had... A lot of experience. I edited television. I went up to all the television places in Missoula and they said, oh no, you're overqualified. <laughs> I will push your little cart and hand out your things. I, I just need a job. Because I, I, I push well? I'm overqualified? <laughs> you know, and, and we were kind of talking one day and, and it wasn't really complaining. It was more just, I guess, looking back to Egypt. But I had told her, I said, I... I really would like to stay. Now, keep in mind, we've been living on tuna and macaroni and cheese. And because I told God I was, I was really tired of macaroni and cheese, and somebody came and gave us a case of tuna. <laughs> and and uh, I, I told her, I said, I would, really like, and I, I would really like a steak, and I'd like fried rice. And she said she really wanted a chocolate pie. And it was just something that we talked, and all the way okay? Well, there was a lady in the church that we were attending at the time. She, she'd been gone. She'd been in California. And she came home and she said, I would really like to have you guys over to my house for dinner. I said, okay, uh, if you guys could come over, da, da, da. We showed up at our house and she said, I, I am really sorry. She said, I've been so busy trying to get stuff lined out from California. She said, I haven't gone to the grocery store. I, I, this is going to sound really weird, but she said, I've got some steaks in the freezer and I thought I'd just make some fried rice. <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't sound bad at all. And then as we were eating, she said, I, didn't, I was going to go down to Dairy Queen and buy a thing of ice cream, but she said, I didn't get down there, so she said, I've got a frozen pie in the, the freezer. Would it be okay if we had chocolate pie for dessert? <laughs> and Christian and I were just floored. <laughs> because this was not something, it's not like I got on my face before God and said, Oh God, I want steak and fried rice. And if you could work in a chocolate pie for Christy, that would be good too. <laughs> it wasn't even a prayer. It was just a comment that we were just kind of talking. And God laughed, and he moved his hand, and we had steak and fried rice and chocolate pie. Okay, sometimes God does that. But sometimes we get our priorities wrong. Now, stuff, okay, I'm going to move on because I, I don't want to spend all the time talking. People, do you give thanks for the people that God has placed in your life? You know, Paul says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. How often do we thank God for people? Okay? Um, and not, not, not just, I mean, you know, I put family on the list. That's a given. How about other people in your life? How about other things that are going on? Are you thankful for them? You know, in Acts, Paul comes into, um, let, let's go there real quick. Um, Acts 28 real quick. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And he knows things are not going to go well there. It's already been prophesied over him. Um, I'm 
Acts 28. Oh, I'm sorry. He's, he's already been to Jerusalem. He's already been prophesied over that he's going to be bound. He's going to be handed over. This has happened in Jerusalem. He's pleaded unto Caesar. They're sending him to Caesar. He's had the shipwreck. He's been bitten by a snake. And he's going to Rome. Okay? So, in verse 14... Uh, he's talking about being in Puteoli. He says, There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns of Venus. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Paul saw the brothers. And, and he took courage and he thanked God. Think about this for a minute. Paul knows where he's going. He's going to face Caesar that has nothing, no interest at all in Christianity. He's going to deliver the gospel to Caesar. Okay? And Paul is giving thanks. Daniel. Um, you guys know the story of, of the, the wise men, you know, the, the three stallion guys that are bouncing around and they're coming up with a plan and uh, they're concerned because the king likes Daniel more than them, and, and he's, he's, they come up with a plan to get rid of Daniel. O oh, king, let no one for a period of so many days worship anyone but you. That'll get him. Now, Daniel, three times a day, would go to the front window in his house, the window that looked toward Jerusalem, and he'd get on his knees and he'd pray to God. When Daniel heard the decree was signed by the king, what did he do? He went to the front window, right in front where everybody could see, and he got on his knees and he thanked God. Okay? He was thankful. People, are you thankful for the people that God has put in your life? Um, Will Rogers made a comment once, and it stuck with me for, when I read it, it stuck with me for um, it's over 30 years now. Because when I first read it, I didn't really get it, and I'm, I'm starting to get it now. He says, treat your friends like family, and treat your family like friends. Because see, we treat our family oftentimes significantly worse than we treat our friends. Because our friends, they're going to leave soon. You know, they're going to go home and they're going to go off their way so we can bear with it for a while. But our family, oftentimes, you know, we let down our guard and we're ugly around our family. And I like what Will Rogers had to say. No, treat them like you would your friends. Be nice to them. As a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks we're going to be talking about this. But um, in Titus it talks about the older women teaching the younger women to love their husbands and children. And, and the word there is, is the word for friend. Teach them to be friendly to their husband and children. And how in the family dynamic, we have to be friendly to each other. So we have stuff. We have people. What about trials? What about trials? What about tribulations? What about the ugly things in this life? What are, what are we supposed to do with those? We give thanks. Again, we go back to, you know, this is the thing that I struggle with. In every situation, in every circumstance, we are called to give thanks. Do I give thanks for what is happening in the moment? Um, you know, I, I've heard people argue, oh, no, 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 it doesn't say you, you thank God for being put in prison, but you find things to thank God for. I, that's not how I read it. It says, for everything. And there's a couple of passages that I think kind of support this. James chapter 1. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy. Again, it's a perspective issue. We look at trials and, and hardship as a bad thing. But God doesn't. Why? Because he's using those to develop in us a character and a nature that reflects him. And God gives retests. Because if you blow it the first time, don't worry, there will be another one. And if you blow it that time, don't worry, there will be another one. 
until we get it right. Peter writes that these trials have come upon you that you may be refined as pure gold. Okay? God wants perfection in his people. He wants to get rid of the dross. Now, we have perfection attributed to us. It's given to us from Jesus Christ. But now we've got to work out all the garbage that is us. We've got to get rid of the stuff that we bring into the relationship. God wants to burn that out of us. And sometimes it takes a lot of beating and a lot of burning to get rid of it. We need to thank God for those things because do we really want to be Christ-like? Do we want to be worthy of the name Christian? <clears throat> That's what it takes. As a matter of fact, Jesus says that if you would follow him, you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Wake up in the morning, put yourself on the cross. Have a cup of coffee, put yourself on the cross. Don't have a cup of coffee, you're already on the cross. <laughs> right? I know there's a lot of you that that's what it's like. If there's no coffee, you're on the cross. When things are going well, get on the cross. When things are not going well, get on the cross. Okay? Why? Because we have to understand that the only negative element in the relationship that we have with God is us. Okay? And he wants to refine us and purify us that we may be as pure gold. So trials and tribulations come upon us so that we may be refined. A lot of it's because of our own stupidity. I'm stupid that way. I go, who I'd really like to do that? God says, don't. But I really want to. Don't. I really want to do that. Don't do that. I really want to. Fine, go ahead. See what happens. God, why didn't you tell me it was going to be this bad? <laughs> that's what it's like a lot of times, isn't it? I know that's the way I am. I hear that still small voice. It gets louder and louder and louder. So I get louder and louder and louder so I can ignore it and do what I want. And then things get bad. And then I get on my knees before God and I say, well, help me. Trials and tribulations. Now these next two I really like. Salvation. Are you thankful for the salvation? Are you thankful every day? Are you thankful throughout every day for the salvation that is yours? So rich and abundant his mercy is toward his people that Jesus came and died on a cross in my place. I think that alone is enough to give us, to fill us with thankfulness from here till the day we go home. Mm -hmm. but let's, let's set all the other stuff aside. Let's set aside the stuff. Let's set aside the people. Let's set aside the trials and the tribulations. We should be rejoicing because of what he has done and for no other reason than that from the cross. The salvation that he's given us. I mean... Greater love has no man than that he lay down his life for his friend. What about his enemy? Because we were his enemy when he did this. We were hostile to him when he did this. So this salvation that is so richly given to us, so unworthy, we're so unworthy of it, that should be enough to celebrate Thanksgiving every day. But he doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just say, oh, come to the cross, put yourself on the cross, accept the blood of the cross, and then we're done. Then you've got to deal with the rest of your life on your own. No, he doesn't, because he has sent one to us, his spirit, to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us. <clears throat> Are you thankful for God's presence in your life every day? Remember, he's omnipresent. But for some people, he's on the outside. But for those of us who have invited him in, he's on the inside. He is with us with everything that we go through. He's right there with us. To give us counsel, to give us comfort, to give us wisdom. Are we thankful for that presence day in, day out? See, we really... Christy, I asked Christy to type this up last night. And she made a list and it was 1 through 10. I said, no. 
because we should have much more than 10. I said, people will blow through 10 real easy. And then I told her, I said, we're going to make this a little more difficult. We're going to, we're going to put God and family on here. Because I, I could just go through my family and have all 10 of them <laughs> with some extras. And it's getting to the point where I can go through my family and get all 25. <laughs> we need to re-examine our lives, re-examine how we look at everything. Re-examine, you know, I went for a long period of time, I, actually I had to take a retest on this one, but I went through a long period of time without a job. And that was back when I was pulling weeds and, and we got steak and fried rice. But I'll tell you, that was probably the most dramatic growth that I've ever had in my life as far as my Christian walk. Because every day I was so utterly dependent on God to answer our needs. I was in His Word. I was studying. I was praying. I was lifting up before Him. I was worshiping Him when I didn't want to worship Him. And I was oftentimes brutally honest with God. <coughs> God, this stinks. I hate it. I don't like it. I want you to change it. And He was so very patient with me. He was so very patient that He allowed me a retest. Fifteen years later, we got to go through it again. I'm hoping I passed. <laughs> D plus. <laughs> I'm hoping I pass. But I know my attitude was completely different because our God is so much better than our circumstance. So, we've got, I went longer than I thought. I was really going to try and make this very short. I'm going to open this up. I'm going to ask if you would stand up, if you feel comfortable. And just share with the congregation something that you are grateful for. Thanksgiving is coming up on Thursday. Uh, we tend to think of it as turkey and football. In my house, it's turkey and turkey. Um, so, but we don't often think about what it is that we are celebrating. Uh, sometimes we might go, oh yeah, you know, the Indians and the people in the black and white suits, and, and they had turkey. And, well, no, really, they didn't, but that's okay. <laughs> So, what are we thankful for? And I'm opening the floor. Who would like to share? Benjamin. I'm um, really thank God for definitely it. I do want to thank you. Thank for God for um, our doctors in America and for the medical practices we have in our nation. I know, uh, frankly, a lot of people I know love to be dead for. Labor and birth of Judah, I was told that they needed to change.
and hard to receive. <coughs> and that we get to have them here in the bitter room. <laughs> because, you know, we drove through Wyoming. <laughs> we drove through parts of New Mexico and we drove through all of Texas. <laughs> I feel sorry, those people don't need ice beers. <laughs> but I saw somebody stand up for here. You and your family. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. And thank you. I'm thankful for God calling you to be part of the ministry. You and that's, you know, that's something that all of us should reflect on because God has called each and every one of us. Yes. Every one of us has a role to play, a part to fill in the body of Christ. Every one of us is called to be a minister. Uh, and I think about this for a minute. We are the priesthood. He has called us to be priests unto him. Uh, that, that didn't happen before the cross. It was always, these people are the priests, and you have to go to them in order that you might present to God. <coughs> but now we can come directly to him. That's, that's cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Rich. You know, kind of thankful for the hard times, too, because we have a hard time that when the Lord can grow you up to know us. Yeah. And we can That's true. Free and grow you up. We don't have to crawl around and bite your hand. Yeah. Even if you have to crawl around your face with a shop back sucking up water, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for his word. Yes. He gives me direction. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the light into our path. Mm -hmm. uh, man, that's. It's incredible um, how often I'm struggling with something. So oftentimes I'm not even realizing I'm struggling with it. And I open his word and the answer's right there. And I'll read through it and it's like ding, 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 ding. Pay attention. So, and it's not just black and white on the page or some of you maybe red and white. I mean, really think about that for a minute. We have red letter editions. Shouldn't it all be in red letters? Isn't it all his word? <laughs> but it's living and it's active. And you can read the same thing three times and God can speak to you at three different places in your life. That's right. Amen. Christian. I'm thankful for the salvation of all of my children. Yes. And, and just watching God work in their lives and knowing that he is taking care of them and yes. they're in his hands. That's, that's a blessing. And the, like Dennis was saying about faith, that he asks us to walk by faith, not by sight. But when we take a step of faith, he blesses us with, with sight. Yeah. Kind of like when you see the, the wind blows and you, you know it's blowing because you see the leaves. It's like that you know God's moving because he does physical things that you can see. And that I'm just thankful for his active involvement. Fine. Worship music and the worship leaders. <laughs> you know, the it is incredible that... God has designed us such that music can touch just about anyone, you know. And, and is it, I, I absolutely find this amazing, sometimes appalling, that there's all different kinds of music that can touch all different kinds of people. Because some of the music that touches me negatively really blesses some of my children. And, and I think, how can you worship to that? Bill, Bill grew up. <laughs> no, no, they'll just grow older. <laughs> and, and then what will happen is their kids will be listening to a different type of music yeah. and they'll be going, what is wrong with you? Why isn't this good enough? Anyone else? I'm thankful for the uh, good the Lord shows me that has come from things like that. Yeah. That's good. I put it on my list. Members of this church, uh, the divorce for helping me out when I was in Spokane and stuff. Driving all the way to Spokane to get my studies. And Dustin's catching up on his school thanks to them getting in. Also, he got eight 
eight subjects done, staying at their house last Wednesday, which is more than he's ever done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, well, anyway, he, he did really well. He said it was really easy for him to study at this house, and he had a good time to just all the things that the boards have done, thank you. And uh, also, um, Sally and Kathy have been such a blessing to me. Especially Sally, just I just like Sally a lot. <laughs> <laughs> She's just kind of like a, like the perfect grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just really kind of some of her. I like Sally. <laughs> you can call me grandma. <laughs> from experience, but it takes a truly wise man to learn from somebody else's experience. I haven't got there yet. I'm not saying that. I'm just thankful for all the things God has kept me to save from being raised in a Christian home. Scott? You know, I think this time of year we um, sometimes lose sight of all of the volunteer organizations and things like that that help the people in need, especially this time of year uh, when, when families are just, you know, they're tore apart and they just don't have anything else. I mean, the Panty Partners, Closed Closet, Operation Christmas Child, I mean, all of these organizations, are, the majority of them are faith organizations, not all of them are, but even the ones that are are still doing a, a great service to people, you know, they may not, you know, be, you know, absolute Christians, but they're doing God's work in you know what I mean, which is awesome. So, I, you know, sometimes we just take for granted these organizations just exist and maybe they just run by themselves. But I'm sure Shelly knows about Operation Christmas Child and the others that have, have done some of these things and Kathy and Closed Closet and, and all this. There's a lot of work involved and a lot of people that have to dedicate time off the clock. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. Yep. And that's kind of the way God designed it to work anyway. And, and I know. Well, at some point we'll talk about it, but, uh, how the church has abrogated so much of its responsibility and left it to the civil institutions to take care of. Yeah. I just would like to share that, you know, we're talking about being thankful. I've got a chance to spend some time around Dom, who comes to this church, and uh, that's one of the most thankful men I've ever seen. <laughs> very uh, humbling. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> we got that on tape. What an awesome, <laughs> what an awesome <laughs> church family. Yes, yes, yes. Mackenzie. I'm thankful how God's blessings go around. How one minute someone can bless you, and then the next day or year or something, you bless somebody else, and you get blessed even more because you bless them. And it just constantly swirls. And I love that. Yeah. <laughs> 